to the Daily Fantasy Edge. I'm your host, Peter Jennings. I go by CSU Ram 88 across the daily fantasy industry. And as always, joined by Adam Levitan and Al Zeidenfeld. Adam, some really positive feedback on the solo pod. I too enjoyed it and thought it was one of your best ever. Uh, what are the news and notes on the podcast, bud? You almost blew my eardrums out with that with that hello. That was a, a big time hello. Uh, yeah, no, no news and notes, really. The news and notes are the Listener League continues to press on at, at 8K people. Uh, get in there. All you have to do is go to Google, go to DK Playbook, find the logo, find the link. Uh, not very difficult. Done with that bit. Uh, so yeah, get in the Listener League, fill it, hashtag make it bigger. And yeah, Ashley came up with one of the tweets of the year. Uh, I think it was yesterday. Uh, everybody's having a lot of fun with the Manscaped stuff. So, so yeah, things are good. Al, you just recently battled Adam in a draft uh, where you guys took DraftKings salaries, but you had to draft your roster. So you went back and forth. That was pretty fun. How's everything going in your world? Things are good. Uh, I think I kind of waxed Adam in the draft. We're going to see how that actually plays out. Uh, I think I have the much higher floor. He's got a GPP lineup. He could have uh, could have 80 points, could have 280 points. It remains to be seen which one that lineup is going to have. <laughs> Mine will probably be like 150 to 170 point lineup. So hopefully I can hold there. That video is up on YouTube if you guys want to look for it. Uh, shouldn't be that difficult to find. Other than that, things are going pretty well, man. I'm just, I'm in the flow. I'm really... I'm really enjoying football season. You guys know I love doing content. I'm really happy to be here on the edge, just like every week. And I mean, how does it feel when your wife's better at social media than you, Pete? That's definitely true. That's a hundred percent a fact. And uh, yeah, she's better than me at pretty much everything. So that's not surprising at all. Um, but yeah, Manscaped, hopefully uh, they will be hooking me up and uh, yeah, Ashley is uh, on fire on, on social right now. So uh, any uh, final thoughts, boys, before we dive into the games? Let's do it. No, let's do All it, right. CSU Wookiee. First game on the slate, we have the Jaguar. <laughs> yeah. Ja- Jaguars <laughs> and Panthers here. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna move past the Wookie comment there. Now. <laughs> really got me off my flow. Ready? You know, Jaguars, Panthers, forty-one total. Carolina three and a half point favorites. Adam, save me. What are the news and notes here? Yeah, obviously Kyle Allen's going to start again. Cam Newton remains out. I think kind of the big news, or if it, if you consider it big news, I mean, uh, Jalen Ramsey, I don't know if he's going to play or not. I don't think he's practicing today, Thursday, didn't practice Wednesday. You know, I think this defense just takes a whole other turn when he's not in the lineup. We saw Peter's boys even get a lot going against this Jacksonville defense uh, last week without Jalen Ramsey in the lineup. So, you know, I'd be more open to Curtis Samuel and DJ Moore plays for sure. If Jalen Ramsey is out, I'd be more open to all Carolina plays. I think if Jalen Ramsey is out and yeah, I mean, at the running back position now, we have two of the highest usage players in the entire NFL at any mm-hmm. position, Christian McCaffrey and uncle Lenny. I, I think a big question, a lot of people are going to be, be asking themselves. Um, are you afraid of the Jacksonville defense with McCaffrey, uh, are you afraid of the Carolina defense, which has actually played extremely well and way better than a lot of people have thought uh, with Uncle Lenny? I mean, one, I think I'm higher on the Carolina defense than most. They're one of the highest pressure teams in the league in terms of pressuring the passer and their defense hasn't really adjusted yet. Their price hasn't really adjusted to reflect the amount of pressure that they're putting on opposing quarterbacks, which, as we know, is the greatest predictor of fantasy point success in DFS. So like that, obviously sacks and fumbles and interceptions, but uh, higher touchdown upside for a team that applies a ton of pressure as well. Uh, in terms of Christian McCaffrey, we saw a, a generational game last week from Christian McCaffrey, one of only two players since 2004 to post a 25 carry 10 catch game. So uh, obviously Jacksonville is a tough defense with or without uh, Jalen Ramsey, but I get to roster a running back one and an RB one for a total price of 40 of 8,700. Sign me up. I know that the defense is tough. I know that efficiency might be a, a little bit of an issue for Christian McCaffrey, but as long as he keeps getting fed the ball as much as he's getting fed the ball and what Bonifant has, what four touches on the year. Snaps, There's no four snaps. Yeah. Four snap. Jesus, not even touches. <laughs> 
I mean, it's absurd. He's just going to be there all the time. They have to give him the ball because it's not like they have a Cam Newton that can create things. So Kyle Allen has to lean on him more. And we saw the same thing happen last year when Cam went out. McCaffrey's usage kind of went up. Uh, I think he's got the safest floor. I think we have enough value to pay for him. And we'll get to that as we get through all the other games. There's plenty of value on this slate uh, to go stars and scrubs. I don't know if I see a reason to go Leonard Fournette, even though his volume has been outstanding. Uh, coming off of a 200-yard game, th this looks like the letdown spot, at least for me, with them playing on the road, coming into this game. His volume will be there. I expect the efficiency to be down. I lean heavily towards McCaffrey. Yeah, McCaffrey seems like close to a lock uh, on this slate, at least for cash game lineups. Uh, and I really like the Carolina defense as well. Uh, big upgrades on their defensive line. They're getting a ton of pressure and were a really high-performing defense, ton of fantasy points. They finished in the mid-20s last week, and this is a good matchup against Jacksonville, who we know is going to throw a lot. I'm probably not as high on Leonard Fournette this week as maybe others are. It sounds like, Al, you're not quite as high either. If I was going to play a Jaguar, I'd probably be Sh uh, Shark, uh, who has been really, really, really good. Um, mm -hmm. Just been straight balling out this season. He's only 5000 and that does seem like a, a mispricing to me um, especially relative to the other receivers in this in this game. I mean, D.D. Westbrook is still 5,300, uh, 300 more than Shark. D.J. Moore is 5,200, and Curtis Samuel at 4,500, I think, will be an intriguing play. But uh, this is a lower total here, Adam. Uh, are you high on Leonard Fournette? Because you definitely mentioned him last week. Yeah, no, I'm not, not particularly. I mean, I've lost so much money on Leonard Fournette over the last two years. Like, you could, like, feed a small island somewhere. It's just, like, so absurd I, I didn't have him last week and and yeah uh, I'm, I'm tilting uh so no no I, I you know he's gonna touch the ball 20 plus times but you know things like last week can happen but I, I don't think it'll be this week but who knows I have a futon yeah. here in the basement Adam yeah. I mean Pete's already got the the guest room upstairs locked down but if you need a, a bed <laughs> I have an extra one here for you I'm always ready to take care of my brothers whenever the situations rise so there is a bed a futon down here for you if you need Good. it I'm bringing Jerry. Fair enough. <laughs> Perfect. We're all going to live the Smith's life here down the road. Um, let's move on to the Patriots at Redskins. 42 and a half total. Uh, Patriots are favored by 15 and a half points here. A lot of news and notes, Adam, specifically around the Redskins quarterback position. Yeah, I mean, do we really care? I mean, this is Thank arguably you. the best defense in the entire NFL. And like, yeah, I don't know who's going to start. It's going to be Haskins. It's going to be McCoy. I don't think it's going to be Keenum. I don't know if Terry McLaurin is going to play, but... You know, it's just the Redskins from the ownership down are such a disaster. I just, uh, I was actually pissed at myself that I even played any Paul Richardson last week uh, or Trey Quinn last week just because I just want nothing to do with this team whatsoever. On, on the other side, of course, they're going to shred. Uh, we don't know how they're going to shred. I think Rex Burkhead's foot seems to actually be a legit injury. He's, they seem to limit him last week, which opens things up more for James White. Uh, they seem not to have much of an interest in getting Sony Michelle going. Maybe that changes here. And I also think Julian Edelman will be healthier this week uh, with that rib issue. But yeah, I mean, I'll, last week was such a, a tough game, a brutal matchup playing Buffalo. Now they can do whatever they want. Maybe it's Philip Dorsett. Maybe it's Gordon. Maybe it's Edelman. Uh, maybe it's White, but, but they'll be able to do whatever they want. I mean, I think there's touchdown upside for the pass catchers on New England. But other than that, like, why would I want very many shares of this game? It's so, the outcomes even for New England are so highly variant with them having as many tools in the shed as they have right now. And touchdowns should be scored somewhat easily for them. There is relevance to having shares of this offense versus the field. Uh, but I don't see anybody that's cash game viable in this game. One one t one play that I think we have to talk about, and I think where the quarterback becomes relevant, especially if it's Haskins, is the Patriots' defense. They're forty three hundred, they're five hundred mm -hmm. more than the next most expensive defense in the Bears. But I mean, if you've been playing the Patriots' defense this year, you're making money, uh, and that's one yeah. mistake. I've not had enough shares. They're averaging twenty point eight DK points per week, <laughs> which is just absolutely absurd. And by all the metrics, I mean they gave up their first touchdown of the season last week, and. They're just getting a ton of turnovers. Um, you know, a lot of people are talking about this is one of the best Patriots defenses they've had during this Belichick Brady run. So they're really expensive. I tend to want to pay down, which is, has cost me so far this season. But especially going against this Redskins team that's so bad at offensive line. And if Haskins is starting, um, you know, he's going to run around, take a lot of sacks and 
most likely turn the ball over. So what do you guys think about the Patriots defense at 4,300? I'm going to have shares in tournaments for sure. I don't know that I can get them into a cash game lineup this week. I definitely think they're viable in leagues, in single entry, in three max, and in mass multi-entry tournaments as well. But speaking of how aggressive they've been with pricing up certain defenses this year, teams going from like 2,800 when they play a Miami, they go up to like 3,800, moving the Patriots up to like 4,300 this week. I think that's great. Can we see the same thing on the other side? Because... What are the Redskins right now? They're they're 1,800, which is great. They broke through the salary floor, right, from 2,000. They went down to 18. But you're still never rostering them at 1,800. But if you made them like 200, now we can talk about should you roster the Redskins at 200 versus mm-hmm. 4,300. Now there's enough variance between the floor defense and the ceiling defense to the fine folks at DraftKings who run the salaries. Can we just eliminate the salary floor from 2000 or 1800 and make it like 100 and see if like Miami people would play Miami at 100 or 200 or 300 nobody's playing them at 2k so they're not even a playable defense from a game theory point of view you make them 100 or 200 what if they have like four points for 100 that's great now you can fit in an extra 6k wide receiver or another 8k running back now there's now there's some room that we can play with here some meat left on the bone that's the the thing I want to see broken. Like, yeah, the Patriots are 4,300. Yes, they're still in play for tournaments. The Redskins aren't at 18. Make them 200. Now they're in play. Now we got something we could talk about. Yeah, I, I think if you looked at like the distributions of what would happen with the Patriots defense, you know, in games where they don't score a touchdown, like, you know, they never, hardly ever are worth it at 4,300, you know? So you're still relying on that really big defensive play not just strip sacks not just holding the team to six points or whatever like you actually need the touchdown so i don't know but they keep getting them i mean so yeah i mean they're crushing yeah, i've struggled with I mean, that the floor all year. game is 10 so far they've had 10 and 11 in the two games where they did not have a defensive touchdown right. that's a ridiculous so if you pay 4300 4, and you get 10 i mean it's a disaster i can get i can get 10 for a from tournament 20, i agree from a, for from a tournament i agree yeah I've made the mistake of not playing. I don't even know if it's a mistake. They just have been so good. So that's why I bring it up. I mean, I think there's a ton of defenses that I love. We just talked about that Carolina game. They're 2,600. I think they're an awesome play. You know, we'll get into mm-hmm. some of these other games. There's great value uh, with a lot of these defenses. And Al, you bring up a great point. I think the perfect slates and the best thing that DraftKings can do with pricing is make every single player in consideration. And obviously, there's guys that you're never going to play. But, uh, you know, to your point, if you made the Redskins 100 bucks uh you know a hundred dollar salary people would play them because it opens up other combinations so i'm totally with you there uh speaking of games that don't look that enticing we have the buffalo bills at the tennessee titans current total 38 and a half tennessee's favored by three points marcus Mariota did kind of break the slate with aj brown though last week adam uh what are the news and notes here yeah, I mean, I'd caution people. AJ Brown and, and Corey Davis are still kind of rotational wide receivers for this team. And now they play this Buffalo defense I have a ton of respect for. From an injury perspective, you know, we'll see if Josh Allen's going to play. It's crazy, man. I like, I'm worried about these guys. I actually like feel a kinship to Josh Allen because I've played him so much over the last like year and a half. And he got knocked out cold last week. And now they're saying he might play this week. I mean, it, it's scary, man. I hope he's making uh, the right decisions. Uh, for his long-term health but yeah you know I don't know if Devin Singletary is going to play I don't know if Josh Allen's going to play if Josh Allen does play I guess he's okay but he wouldn't be someone I, I would be uh, focused on so yeah I think this is probably the worst game from a fantasy perspective on the board I would guess yeah but the Titans defense is only 3k and aside from the one game against Jacksonville in Jacksonville They've had 13 sacks in the other three games. So I want defenses that can get pressure on the quarterback. Only 3K, so you're not having to pay up to 36, 38, or 4,300. Not exactly a bargain basement defense, but at least you've got some sack upside there as well. Against yeah, possibly a backup them. quarterback. If Josh Allen's there, it's still a good play. But, you know, if against Barkley, it's probably even better. I have them against Al. Uh, the dogs need it. I'm playing that, that heads-up game <laughs> against Al, by the way, for uh, dog charity here in philadelphia um we need it titans defense we need it bad we need like a 30 ball from the <laughs> titans defense <laughs> yeah, we're playing for we're playing for 250 dollars if if my team wins uh adam has to donate 250 dollars to no kid hungry if adam wins i have to donate 250 dollars to uh an animal shelter both really good charity so hopefully somebody's going to win out of this one uh in terms of the charity so that's all that matters to me yeah. i mean also i want to beat the hell out of adam but that's <laughs> a different story 
Yeah, I'm not going to say much about this game. Great job by you guys with the charities. That should be awesome. Titans defense, good play. I, I don't really see anything else. 38 and a half total. Uh, just an uninspiring offenses on both sides. Although we did see Mariota can flash a high ceiling, um, which I think people were writing him off after that Jacksonville game, which he's been bad, but um, in some better matchups, we'll see what can happen. And certainly it's relevant when we get into the Falcons Texans game. Uh, let's move to the Ravens at Steelers. And this is a really interesting game. Uh, middling total 44 and a half Ravens currently a three point favorite, uh, but the Ravens offense uh, certainly has been really good this year. Not their best performance versus Cleveland, but their defense, Adam, I think is worth noting. Uh, Cleveland, and specifically Nick Chubb, ran all over this defense. So now we have the Steelers and kind of a different offense with Mason Rudolph at quarterback and the Wildcats stuff they're doing. Uh, what are the news and notes from an injury perspective and your thoughts kind of on this Ravens defense that hasn't been you know, the defense we thought coming into the season? Yeah. Um, Mark Andrews continues to battle this foot issue. You know, he's going to keep playing, I assume, but it seems like it's limiting him to some degree. Uh, James Conner is dealing with an ankle injury he sustained on Monday night. I feel like he's going to end up playing, but we'll see on him. Obviously, if he doesn't, Jalen Samuels would be uh, front and center. And then Vance McDonald uh, maybe gets back this week. I don't know. But yeah, I don't know if they can run that same game plan that they ran against the Bengals. Like, can they really run uh, Wildcat and tap passes and all this garbage, uh, you're not playing the Bengals, now you're playing the Ravens. And I understand the Ravens' defense uh, has not been great uh, this year, but certainly way, way, way better than than what the Bengals can offer. So I, I don't know. Like I, I have more faith in Mason Rudolph than I think other people do. I think he can, when asked, um, make plays for this team, but it's certainly not looking great right now. And I honestly don't know what game plan they're going to employ. If they employ this Jalen Samuels Wildcat stuff again, it's going to be really hard uh, to find to find reliable plays and you know floor ceiling ranges are going to be really really wide I mean injuries are a concern in this game as well right Connor's got that ankle he's dealing with you mentioned Mark Andrews with his foot and Andrews you said last week played how many snaps 29 yeah 29 something yeah. something along and he ran 22 routes and yeah. was targeted on 36 percent of those routes so like when he's on the field he's going to be you know that team's going to be passing so even with the limited snaps, as that foot gets better, you'd assume it gets better over the course of, you know, of, of the season, right? We can assume that those snaps are going to go up, which is going to mean he's running more routes, which means he's going to have a higher floor. He's, he's just not priced right. Him and Waller are just not priced correctly yet for the amount of volume that they're seeing. Pete? He's, he's in the he's in the closet. <laughs> I'm in the closet with uh, bad Wi-Fi. I'll have to edit that out. All right, I, I agree <laughs> that that Andrews is not priced correctly. Uh, I do think he has a lot of upside. And Lamar Jackson is a, a stack. Uh, you you want to play Lamar Jackson if you're playing 150 tournament lineups or a lot of tournament lineups. You want exposure to Lamar Jackson every single week. His rushing ability is just so ridiculous. And, uh, you know, Marquise Brown it hasn't paid off recently. It's it's a little frustrating. He paid off big, playing very limited snaps now in this full-time role. He hasn't been turning those air yards into fantasy points. So at some point, that's going to be another really good play. And on the Pittsburgh side, you know, Juju Smith-Schuster is definitely trending the wrong direction. Maybe he's worth it this week as a, you know, low owned kind of high upside play. Uh, we saw the big touchdown two weeks ago. Um, I do think this Ravens defense, especially in the secondary, is not nearly as good as what people think, especially after seeing, you know, some of the results. So I do think there's some sneaky plays here, but there aren't really any standout cash game, really high equity plays. Adam, any final thoughts? No, no, I, I, yeah, Juju is, is going to be, I mean, it's scary for Juju right now with the way that they're playing. I and mean, you don't know if, if they, if Mason Rudolph were to drop back 40 times, I'd be fine with Juju. I just don't know that he's going to do that. Okay. Yeah, with Jalen Samuel's know, but... new role, is he in play at 4,100? Yeah. If or that's is his this, role. Is that's this what... not his new role, right? Like this yeah. is the uncertainty that we have. Like daily fantasy yeah. is a game of partial information, but with the partial information that we have, and assuming, based on the success they had last week, they are at least going to try this moving forward, are they not? Yeah. The tap passes are so cheap, man. Those shouldn't even be yep. completions. It's so, so cheap. Yeah. Instead of the jet sweep just being a handoff, it's just weak. Right. And then, oh, yeah, yeah that's a catch. Free that's catches a full point. for everybody. Yeah, yeah it's a full-point yeah. PPR. And if somebody breaks one off, that's passing yards for Jalen Samuels. So right. he's got to be a nightmare to make projections for right now. Yeah, yeah, like 10 passing yards for Jalen Samuels. He does have the most equity of any player on the slate for a passing touchdown, 
receiving touchdown and rushing touchdown. So he has he has that. Mm-hmm. Forty one hundred is not a bad price. If Connor's even limited or, or you know stays on the injury report, he'll skyrocket in terms of ownership and uh, yes. at that price tag given his role. But I expect Connor to play, and it sounds like you do too, Adam. Yeah. All right. Moving on, this game is my favorite game on the slate, and, and it could really burn me, uh, and it's gross to say, but the Cardinals at Bengals here, 47-point total, Bengals three-point favorites. Uh, we have some news and notes, Adam, but specifically I'm excited about this game because I'm anticipating a lot of passing. Yeah, I mean, this is, you know, kind of like when the Sixers were, like, going full-on tank and, like, the whole fantasy community would be, like, watching every Sixers game because, like, on both sides – There were a lot of plays just because of how bad they were and how cheap they were. I mean, this reminds me of that. Um, John Ross is going to miss this game. He's on IR now. AJ Green remains out. I think uh, the top three wide receivers for this game for the Bengals will be Auden Tate and Damian Willis on the outside. Tyler Boyd in the slot, obviously. Uh, You know, offensive line concerns for the Bengals remain. I don't expect them to have three of their top five offensive linemen once again. But you're playing this Arizona team who you know, uh, they're inefficient on offense. Uh, the other team runs so many plays and they're really bad on defense, particularly without Patrick Peterson. So, um, yeah. And then, uh, injuries on the other side, Christian Kirk is out. Demir bird, uh, is likely out and like, they're just passed right over Andy Isabella. They signed Pharaoh Cooper expected to play in the slot alongside Larry Fitz also in the slot. And then Keyshawn Johnson and Trent Sherfield out wide. Uh, you know, there's been rumors they could use David Johnson more in the slot, which would not surprise me uh at all you know i think uh called david johnson a lock for like five to six catches last week ended up i think beating that Uh, and i would consider yeah i mean i would consider him a lock for five or six catches again here in this spot and and so yeah i mean there's there's a lot to chew on there's not only their injuries there's really bad defenses there's there's cheap options so yeah i think one of the most important games on the slate for sure and of course i didn't mention the flow chart yet which i'll i'll leave uh to al i mean here's here's the issue right so typically i want to i want to roster tight ends against Cincinnati but I or sorry against uh, Arizona but I want to do it with guys that are actually involved in the team's passing game now while uh they use Eifert when they get inside the red zone and we saw that even on Monday night when they get inside the five or inside the 10 they look to throw him the ball so there's touchdown upside here I don't think there's a lot of possibility of a seven eight or nine target game even in the absence of somebody like john ross so for him to pay off this salary he's gonna have to get you two touchdowns because the realistic outcome is like three catches on five targets for 27 yards and if there's no touchdowns attached to that then tyler eifert becomes a very risky play so he's not somebody that i'm really considering for cash this week regardless of what the flow chart says i think there are other cheap options that we could go with as well as mid price guys that i think are massively underpriced and can still get to them with standard roster construction this week uh so for me he's a, a tournament dart throw a tournament sprinkle only uh with this flow chart and that's the only reason he's in play is because they're playing arizona but he's extremely 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 touchdown dependent as opposed to every other tight end that's played against arizona so far so that's my rant uh on the flow chart in week five david johnson give me the over on those six catches uh with with kirk possibly missing this game if kirk misses this game it's going to be another another week where you see 9 10 11 possibly 14 targets for somebody like david johnson not being efficient at all running the ball but he's getting a ton of usage in the passing game Farrell cooper not available on this slate or is he no he's not on the he's not on the slate he's signed too late yes they haven't added him yet i mean they can still add him but they have not yet Okay, so currently as we're recording here on Thursday morning at, what, 1.30 Eastern time, or 1.30 in the afternoon uh, on Thursday, uh, he's not available on the slate. David Johnson, Fitzpatrick, two guys that I am most interested in. The outside wide receivers, again, those are dart throws for Arizona just because of the fact that they just don't throw deep at all right now, whether that's a product of them not having a good offensive line or just bad play calling. I think Davis Maddock titled this offense uh, the Horizontal Raid. Hey, Reeves did. Yeah, Lord Reeves, Reeves? started okay. that. It's, yeah, Thank it's, you. Yeah. It's well, it's, it, it's, a good, it's a good name. Very good name. The Horizontal Raid offense uh, in full effect. So guys like David Johnson, Fitzgerald, and Cooper would be my top three targets there. As far as the Bengals are concerned, give me Auden Tate and his terrible 40 time uh, at 6'5" and 230 pounds or whatever he's playing at there's a guy who's shaped like a tight end who's gotten 16 targets the last two weeks with john ross they are a 21 percent 
target share on the Bengals. Now he steps into an even bigger role, has been playing 90% of snaps and against a team that can't stop big pass catchers, you know, in the end zone. I'm going to take Auden Tate at 3,500 is the best value play on the slate overall. Damn it, Al. I, I, yep. I had all these stats. I was ready to talk about Auden Tate and how he's one of my favorite plays in the whole on the main slate. I, I think Auden he should Tate, be everybody's favorite play on the main slate, right? Yeah. Yeah. 3,500 I mean, my, way too cheap. My initial projection that uh, I ran last night was 20% on Auden Tate, but based on the way you guys are orgasming, I think I might have to, uh, I think I might have to raise that, that projection <laughs> on the next run. What was he at? 21.9? Oh, you're saying 20% ownership. Ownership. Projected I ownership, think, yeah. Yeah, I yeah. think he's going to be around 30 in the Millie Maker. Yeah, well, yeah, I didn't realize. Yeah, yeah. yeah, well, now that you guys have blown your loads, yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little lower. I mean, he certainly can still fail, but he is the tight end. I mean, obviously he's playing outside, but he has that body, and I think he's going to work the middle of the field, and he's the perfect player to exploit this Arizona defense that we really want in this game i mean 16 targets like you mentioned he's really big uh six five i think there's a lot of touchdown upside for sure and the best part about this game is these two teams are throwing more than any other two teams in the nfl now granted both these teams are playing from behind a lot given how bad their defenses are and how fast they're playing but i see a ton of plays uh in this game which i really love the Bengals mm -hmm. defense is also i think an interesting play here uh, we've mentioned a lot of uh, different plays throughout. Uh, there's a lot of defenses you can choose from, but 2,500 for the Bengals defense, they're going to get sacks. Kyler Murray's taking the most sacks of any quarterback in the NFL, and I think uh, the Bengals defense certainly makes sense. The other Bengal, I mean, Boyd's obviously in play, but Joe Mixon, um, you know, I haven't played him that much this year. The offensive line concerns are real, but against Arizona, he's going to get a lot of opportunity, and specifically in the passing game, I think he could have a nice game, and uh, – I really, really like his talent. So there's just a ton of guys that make a lot of sense here. There's a lot of ways you can stack up this game. Uh, the way it fails, I guess, is there's just, you know, not many touchdowns, but should be a ton of opportunity, a lot of targets. And uh, yeah, Auden Tate, too, is my favorite play. Adam, any final thoughts? I just want Adam's thoughts on Auden Tate running a 4 7 40 at the combine. Yeah. I mean, it in my, uh, yeah. Uh, I, I'm not the first one to say it or anything, but, you know, it re reminds a lot of people of Calvin Benjamin, you know, and like, I, I think they both went to Florida State. They both have like similar body types. Uh, I, I think Calvin Benjamin is a little bit more explosive. But yeah, I played Auden Tate in preseason. I mean, when he plays these guys in preseason, like he's like seven inches taller than he everybody else on everybody the field. Around. Yeah, he just he just bosses them in the end zone. So yeah, he was he was a decent play in preseason a couple of times. So yeah, I, I, I'm okay with it. Both quarterbacks certainly fine in tournaments as well. Basically, any piece that's going to be on the field a lot, I think, deserves consideration, which uh, is pretty gross considering these teams are 0-7-1 and combined, but perfect matchup versus each other. Uh, next game on the slate is another one that I think is really, really enticing from a fantasy perspective, definitely, uh, especially at the high-end receivers. We have the Falcons at Texans here, Adam. Uh, this total has moved a little bit. I think it most recently moved up to 49. Uh, it's gone between 49 and 50 from what I've seen. Houston, five-point favorites here. Uh, I've died on the Will Fuller train all year, Adam, as have you. Uh, mm -hmm. What are the news and notes, and is Will Fuller finally going to get going? Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> I mean, uh, I hope so. Yeah, <laughs> news and notes. Uh, you know, Kenny Stills, I, I think, um, you know, I don't know if it affects Will Fuller and DeAndre Hopkins that much, but it certainly can't hurt to remove Kenny Stills from the equation. So he's questionable with a hamstring injury. We'll see if he can play. If he can't, it'll be Kiki Kute, who I actually think is a really, really, really talented guy. Uh, he'll be the slot guy uh, on the field for most of the game if Kenny Stills can't go. And yeah, you know, uh, on DeAndre Hopkins, uh, DraftKings is just like too sharp, man. They don't, like, DeAndre Hopkins has three awful games in a row and he's still the most expensive wide receiver on the slate. You know, they just never moved off him I guess it's because he's been somewhat owned even through those three bad games but he's faced Jalen Ramsey he's faced Casey Hayward he's faced James Bradbury in his last three games I mean now he's facing like a rookie I believe um but that might not be right but but either way like you know Falcons I believe are like 27th in past defense DVOA I mean obviously this is the best spot DeAndre Hopkins has seen uh in the last month or so so yeah I mean I wish DeAndre Hopkins was cheaper but he's certainly uh, a great great play and then yeah, I mean, Will Fuller is only 4500 That They haven't raised Will Fuller's price, even though he's been owned a lot. He's like sixth in the league in air yards. 
and he's has like 150 real life yards and zero touchdowns in four games. So, um, you know, and was just yeah. missed on a long touchdown last week. Yeah. Like mm-hmm. every week he's just missed on a long touchdown. Yeah. It's brutal. Um, so yeah. I mean, I know we don't spend a lot of time talking about quarterbacks here, but like Matt Ryan has posted great numbers pretty much every single week, gotten you the 300 yard bonus on DraftKings every single week, multiple touchdowns in three of four with three touchdowns in two of those four. Why are we not more excited? A, why are we not more excited as Adam put it to click Matt Ryan and, and B, how is he still 5,900 after three? four straight 300 yard games and they have no running game and an offensive coordinator that just wants to throw it 45 to 50 times. And he's got really good weapons uh, in Hooper and Julio and Ridley. Why are we not more excited to, to roster Matt Ryan with two of his pass catchers pretty much every single week, considering that the volume's there. Yeah. I, I've been playing Matt Ryan every week as I've tried to become a uh, uh, somewhat of a GPP player. And yeah, I think people don't click him because they don't envision uh they envision all these other guys running for multiple touchdowns and running yeah. for much yards you know i think that's why people don't click him but yeah he's been amazing i mean 300 yard bonus is is really uh in play and likely every week with with matt ryan and julio jones 7700 against houston uh good dvp calvin ridley same sort of thing yes Houston is very tough against tight ends, but Austin Hooper running as many routes per drop back as pretty much any tight end in the league on a week in week out basis in two straight games over 20 fantasy points, averaging 18.4 and still only sitting at 4,500. Uh, the matchup's going to keep some people away. The recent production might drive more people to it. So I think that those two kind of things uh, balance out and he's just not, you're not going to see a big uh, ownership number on somebody like Austin Hooper because of the tough matchup, despite the two straight 25 ish point fantasy days on DraftKings. Yeah, Austin Hooper, most expensive tight end uh, in some other places, which is wild. 33 targets so far. Uh, A little bit of a tougher matchup like you referenced, but this is one of the best games, uh, probably the best game. I mean, we just gushed about the Bengals and Arizona. That's a great game in terms of pace and opportunity, Uh, but in terms of just the the overall talent uh, and also opportunity, this is my favorite game uh, on the board. Um, Love all the plays, Hopkins, Julio, Calvin Ridley, Fuller. I think they're all great. Uh, the running backs here, I have questions for you guys on them. Devontae Freeman obviously hasn't had the year. Adam, you and I thought uh, the offensive line is a real problem for the Falcons, and they're throwing a lot. Uh, but then you also have Carlos Hyde and Duke Johnson, who I, I was hoping to see more Duke Johnson this year, and Carlos Hyde's gotten a lot of opportunity. Both those guys are in like the low 4K range. I think they're going to be both really low owned. Uh, any interest in any of those three, Adam? Uh, I mean, I can't face playing Carlos Hyde. I think Al ended up taking Carlos Hyde in our head to head. Like one of I my spoke about him, but I didn't take him. Oh, okay, never mind. I was hoping that was a chance for Carlos Hyde to get like eight <laughs> carries for twenty five yards and zero touchdowns and zero catches, maybe. But yeah, I can't face Carlos Hyde. Uh, Duke Johnson, man, I wish you know. Uh, maybe uh, they free him this week, but it seems that they really don't have much of an intention to. And yeah, Devontae Freeman, I think uh, I was encouraged that he caught so many balls. He's, he's separating a bit more from Ito Smith and, and yeah, he's had mm-hmm. really bad games against Philly. And I believe it was Minnesota. Like he hasn't been that bad in his other games. So I still have a little bit of hope in, in Devonte Freeman. It's not the worst thing I've ever heard. I think Carlos Hyde is fine this week. Like, mm-hmm. I'm not thrilled. I'm not like, yeah, we got to play Carlos Hyde. You got to jam him in. No, like that's not where I'm at with Carlos Hyde, but like, I think he's fine. He's not thrilling, but he's nice. Yeah, I'm most encouraged by Devontae Freeman. He's the guy that I was going to mention. I mean, nine targets last week. Um, just you know, ended up with eight catches, 72 yards, which is perfect on DraftKings. Has not been able to run efficiently, but he's still getting double-digit uh, rush attempts every week. So I think he's fine. But yeah, my favorite plays are Hopkins, Fuller, Julio, Ridley. I think they're awesome. And uh, we didn't mention Deshaun Watson, who is expensive. I normally want to pay down at quarterback, but man, hard to envision a, a you know a bad game from Watson and. You know, a 30-plus fantasy game definitely seems like it's uh, going to happen more often than not relative to the rest of the quarterbacks on this slate. So I really like Watson quite a bit if you're going to pay up at quarterback. Um, let's move to the Buccaneers at Saints. Um, this is a lower total here. A lot of respect for this Saints defense. They're also playing slower, which makes sense given that they don't have Drew Brees. 46 and a half, um, which I think if Brees was healthy um, and after what Tampa Bay did last week, this would easily be into the 50s. But 46 and a half, Saints three-point favorites. What are the news and notes here, Adam? 
Yeah, I don't know if it's that they're playing slower. I, I think it's just that Teddy just checks everything down, and Drew Brees wasn't exactly pushing the ball down the field either, but he's just not as efficient as uh, as Drew Brees was, obviously, so they're just not expected to score as many points. So, yeah, I, I think that uh, it has a chance to be lower scoring than people realize uh, for sure. Chris Godwin remains uh, dealing with that hip issue, obviously. It's not a major concern after what he did to the Rams uh, last week. Uh, and then, yeah, people, you know, I've seen a lot of season-long people excited about picking up Ronald Jones, playing Ronald Jones. Like, I don't know, man, it's kind of Ronald Jones plays or not for me. Uh, you know, he's uh, still sharing time with, with Peyton Barber. He's still sharing time with Dare and, and, you know, Ronald Jones has three targets in four games, you know? So uh, it's not the kind of thing that, that I can face. Um, you know, Al took Michael Thomas in our, in our head to head thing, which, uh, you know, DraftKings aggressively lowered Michael Thomas's price. I mean, it's adjusted for the Teddy price now. And, um, one thing you can say about Michael Thomas is that he was never running deep routes. People are like, oh, mm-hmm. Teddy doesn't throw the ball down the field. That's true. Like most of Michael Thomas's catches with Drew Brees even are within eight, nine yards of the line of scrimmage anyway. So his role hasn't changed that much. His target share hasn't changed that much. I think the the page, the Saints project to be in the red zone uh, at a lower rate. But yeah, Michael Thomas is still certainly in play at, at, thanks to his price going down really. Yeah, I mean, we talked about DeAndre Hopkins and his price kind of staying static after three really bad games. We've had really consistent games from Michael Thomas every single week in spite of losing Drew Brees. And fun fact, his ADOT's actually higher by 0.4 yards uh, with Teddy Bridgewater than it was last year with Drew Brees. So it's not like he's being utilized any differently, even with the change at quarterback. So I'll take those 9, 10, 11 targets and have them be really close to the line of scrimmage and his 85 or 90% catch rate or whatever it's going to actually end up being at 6,600. This is a player that should be priced at 75 to 8,000. This is a misprice. This is a knee-jerk reaction to a quarterback change when nothing's really changed about the player against a team that you cannot run the ball against and you have to throw. The player that frustrates me right now in this New Orleans offense is Alvin Kamara yo-yoing up and down every single week. It's like they don't realize that, okay, we've got this guy that throws it really close to the line of scrimmage and doesn't want to challenge downfield. So let's just throw it to Michael Thomas and not throw the ball 10 times a game at, at Alvin Kamara. This doesn't make sense to me from a play calling standpoint. Two weeks ago against Seattle in Seattle had a monstrous game. Last week against Dallas, 11.9 points on three targets. Against the Rams, three targets in the games where they lost Drew Brees, the game where they lost Drew Brees. I mean... 8,600, people aren't going to pay for that. They've lowered the price on Michael Thomas to 6,600, but Alvin Kamara hangs tough at 86, in my opinion, making him one of the better contrarian plays on the slate. As everybody, it's, he's a contrarian play and a leverage play. A lot of ownership expected to go towards Michael Thomas. Everybody that plays him probably not going to roster Kamara in the same lineup. And he's going to be a contrarian play on his own. So either way you want to look at it, I think Kamara is a very good play uh, from a expectation of rational coaching maneuver to quote Evan Silva. You know, this is, this is a spot where you should really be invested in Alvin Kamara in tournaments. Yeah. Pay up to be contrarian. We talked about that in this podcast a lot, and it makes a ton of sense, especially with this price tag right next to Christian McCaffrey, who surely will be one of the highest owned players on the slate. So I like that call quite a bit. And yeah, Adam, maybe they're not playing. I, I'm looking at last game. I mean, they ran the ball 27 times, passed the ball 30 times. Uh, and a lot of it is our check downs. Uh, to your point, Al, Kamara, three targets, 17 rush attempts. I'd much rather see that 20 touches be closer to like 10-10, uh, given how mm-hmm. elusive uh, he can be in the open field and just leveraging his ability as a receiver makes a ton of sense, especially with Bridgewater. So uh, that part's frustrating to me too, but I do think he's a really, really good uh, tournament play. And on the Buccaneers side, I'm I'm trying to figure out what to do with the, these pass catchers. O.J. Howard was probably the player I was most wrong about coming into the season. He's just been absolutely dust uh, so far this season. Mike Evans and Godwin, though, uh, Adam, you've put up a lot of stats on them. They're both just absolutely going off now. Um, and Jameis Winston's been really good after week one. So it's a tough place to go into into New Orleans. But do you have a preference uh, on these pass catchers? I know you're obviously a Godwin guy, but... Uh, yeah, do you see a on. specific matchup that, that looks good here? Yeah. I mean, one guy uh, uh, created earth and man, and one guy is just a mere mortal who who falls down every time he catches the ball. I mean, it's not even close. I mean, Mike Evans, uh, is ADOT is absurd. I mean, Jameis Winston has the third highest ADOT uh, in the league, and Mike Evans just, like, goes long and tries to catch the ball. And, like, you know, it's going to happen, and that's how he has these huge games. But I think the more consistent option all year is, is going to be uh, the God himself. 
I think that the more interesting conversation in terms of wide receiver comparison is Godwin to Michael Thomas in this game. One's 6,900, the other one is 6,600. Uh, I think that's the closer argument. If you're not just saying, okay, I'm going to play both and just, you know, use them as a, a run back option from one another. I think that's the more, that's the tougher argument than Godwin versus Evans to me. Pete, which one do you, which one do you prefer out of those two? Or is it just too close to call and it's just a coin flip? Uh, points per dollar, I'll, I'll prefer Michael Thomas this week. Uh, I do still like Godwin a lot. I think people will be on him after last week, but uh, I love Michael Thomas. I mean, he's close to uh, Godwin in terms of fantasy points. I think Godwin's averaging, yeah, 23.7 More. versus 19.8. And Michael Thomas has just missed the 100-yard bonus a couple times and hasn't had that eruption game that I think is inevitable at some point. So I'll take Michael Thomas, um, which I know breaks Adam's heart, but. All right, moving on to the next game, we have the Vikings at the Giants. A um, lot of news and notes here, Adam, especially with how unhappy the Vikings receivers are uh, with Kirk Cousins in this offense, which, man, it's got to be tough. Both those guys not even in the top 50 in target so far this season. So interesting, 43.5 point total. Uh, Vikings are five point favorites. What are the news and notes? Yeah, I mean, we've had the shower narrative, uh, which failed. We've had the Bible narrative, which I wasn't even aware of, but it ended up hitting. And now we have the squeaky kneel, wheel narrative. I mean, uh, Kirk Cousins is out in the media saying he apologizes to Adam Thielen, needs to get Thielen the ball more, et cetera, et cetera. I, I think, you know, the big question is how many times will Kirk Cousins drop back? If you think Daniel Jones can have his foot on the gas and force uh, Kirk Cousins to drop back 30, 35 times. I think Thielen is a very, very interesting play. This Steph Diggs situation, he, you know, he basically confirmed today that he demanded a trade, didn't show up to practice on Wednesday. He'll probably end up playing on Sunday, but I don't know, man. It's weird what's going on with, with Steph Diggs right now. Pretty clear uh, that he wants out. I've seen some rumors that Saquon Barkley is going to be back this week. I have a uh, pretty good th authority that Saquon Barkley is not going to be back this week. So it's the Wayne Gallman show one more time. Obviously a way, way, way more difficult uh, spot and matchup than it was last week when he played the joke of the Redskins. Um, and then Golden Tate will be back. You know, people forgot that the mm -hmm. Giants even had Golden Tate. It's interesting for everybody because, you know, Evan Ingram plays well out of the slot and Sterling Shepard's primary position is in the slot and Golden Tate uh, primary position is out of the slot. So I'm not sure exactly how they're going to handle it. My initial guess is that it'll be more Sterling Shepard outside and more Golden Tate in the slot. Um, but I'd like to kind of see that shake out a bit, particularly because the matchup isn't great anyways. I'd probably rather see how that all shakes out before I got too excited about it. Um, They're going to yeah, run a three-bunch slot illegal formation on the left side with one uh, split end yeah. on the other side of them. Yeah. Yeah, I, I do think it's an interesting game, though, because if they can force each other to kind of put their foot on the gas, I do think there's, there's talented players on both sides. I mean... Does Golden Tate throw too much of a wrench into this offense right now at 4,600 and kind of screw up everybody's value is, is what Adam's saying. And I totally think that he's not wrong in that, in that aspect. Gallman missed practice on Wednesday, but that's just normal. I'm not worried about that at 5,400. I still think that he's one of the better value players in the slate, albeit in, in a somewhat tough matchup. But Minnesota has given up big games to running backs so far this year. We saw a massive game from Aaron Jones. Uh, so I'm probably not going to steer clear of Gallman because of the matchup. Uh, Barkley, whenever he comes back, this should have been a much longer injury. If he's even challenging to be back next week, that's, that's ridiculously soon for a high ankle sprain. Dalvin Cook, though, against the Giants. Pete, are you paying up the 84 to get Dalvin Cook against other guys in that range at running back like McCaffrey, like Ezekiel Elliott, like Alvin Kamara? Uh, where do you see Cook's ownership falling in tournaments? One, two, three, four at the high dollar range with those other three guys. McCaffrey won by a lot. And then I think it's going to be close uh, with Dalvin Cook and some of the other guys. David Johnson, I know, is cheaper. Uh, at 7,500, I think he'll probably mm -hmm. be more heavily owned, but I think a lot of people will go there. I do like Dalvin Cook quite a bit. Um, I think this is a, a great spot for the Minnesota offense. Hopefully they perform. I'm hoping we see some passing to Diggs and uh, Thielen as well. But yeah, Cook is a, a really interesting play. And if you have the money, um, I like paying up at running back relatively this week. So uh, I think Cook will probably be third, I guess, out of the top end guys, if you include David Johnson. Uh, and maybe it's close with Ezekiel Elliott. Uh, but Zeke putting up a stinker on Sunday night football, I think is going to suppress his ownership as well. Um, on the Giants side, you know, Daniel Jones is always interesting with his rushing, but uh, it's a lot harder to pick these pass catchers now with Golden Tate back. I think that does 
muddy the waters quite a bit, just allocating the targets. So to me, Dalvin Cook's the highest equity play. I'm hoping these receivers do well. Uh, Adam, any final thoughts? No, I think it's pretty clear that Kamara will be the least owned out of the guys that For you sure. mentioned by mm-hmm. by by far. And and yeah, I, you know, I think people uh, between Dalvin and, and Zeke, uh, I think it's going to be a tough decision for people, including myself. Yeah, I, I think I prefer Dalvin there still, but I'm a Pollard guy and, you know, obviously like Amara in the passing game. So <laughs> Zeke, I cannot guy. believe. I mean, I'm a Zeke... Pollard. Has anybody ever said those words in that <laughs> oh, order? Oh, yeah. You don't know. You don't know what's going on, Al, in this in this alleged high stakes uh, season long community. These people think that, you know, Pollard is like uh, was going to like steal 10 touches a game from Ezekiel Elliott. Oh, Jesus. He should. Wrong, He's, better. He's better. <laughs> what? <laughs> no, I'm I'm just I, I'm not a Zeke guy. I think he's wildly overrated, played behind one of the best offensive lines and somehow oh, Jerry Jones sure. gave him just a ton of money, which watch Pollard. I mean, Pollard uh, Pollard has a better he has the best fantasy game so far of, of uh, both of those guys this year. I, if, I mean, if Pollard had Ezekiel Elliott's role, he would run for like 1500 yards and like, you know, 15 touchdowns for sure. But he, but he but, doesn't. Zeke but he has doesn't, Zeke's yeah. role. Right. That's, that's all I yeah. care. I don't care about how much they paid him. I don't care about if he held out. I don't care about what Pollard would have done if in case, you know, if your grandma had balls, she'd have been your grandpa, but she doesn't. And they'd have been smooth because of manscaped.com. But that's a whole other story. <laughs> wow. Ezekiel Elliott in this spot. We'll get to it later. God, you got me all riled up now. God damn it. All right. I like Dalvin Cook over Zeke. So <laughs> we'll leave it at that. Um, let's move to the Bears at Raiders. And probably one of the most surprising things last week, uh, you know, a lot of these big dogs ended up winning outright, but specifically the Raiders playing so well versus the Colts, uh, I think caught a lot of people off guard and something to pay attention to going forward um, with this Raiders team. So, you know, right now, uh, you know, the Raiders are five and a half point dogs, 40 and a half total. Um, Not a ton of, you know, plays here, Adam. Chase Daniels starting again for Trubisky. Um, And obviously this game is in London. So what are the news and notes here? Yeah, London game here. Uh, Mitchell Trubisky is not going to play. Chase Daniel will start. I mean, I think the just from a, a real football perspective, the floor on Chase Daniel is probably similar to what Mitchell Trubisky gives them. But Trubisky gives them a higher ceiling, I think. But Chase Daniel will be fine. I mean, he's not. He's one of the more reasonable backups in the league. Uh, I know Al is watching, and I'm also watching the status of Taylor Gabriel, who suffered mm-hmm. a concussion, and we'll see if he is able to play this week. If he's not, I think we'll see a lot of. Javon Wims, who, if you played preseason over the last two years, you're, you're well aware of what Javon Wims was able to do. I mean, for sure, one of the best receivers uh, and really earned his way onto the team uh, uh, by the way he's played in the preseason. And we've also noticed on the Bears side that, uh, you know, we'll see if Mike Davis is active for this game, but David Montgomery has been earning more and more and more of a share of the work in the uh, Bears backfield. So I think at 5,200 is is pretty cheap i think he's right there with the Devonte freeman wayne gallman uh types that are in kind of that low 5k range and then injury note on the oakland side which i doubt anybody really wants to play oakland guys outside of darren waller maybe uh tyra williams though the gazelle uh al's boy is banged up and, and he seems legit questionable i mean waller's just a wide receiver man Waller is basically on pace, and I know we hate on pace, right? But it's after four weeks. He's on pace to break every tight end receiving record in the books, and he's still only 5,000 on DraftKings. Massively underpriced, in my opinion. Should be a 6,500 player. So avoiding him, whether he's on this side of the pond or that side of the pond, uh, I don't care where he's playing. I just care that he's getting a ton of targets and, and catches and yards. Uh, and at People that price, gonna, it's a bit egregious. It, it, it's not going to be because uh, he's in, in London, or it's going to be because people are are going to be hesitant on him because he's playing the Bears. Yeah, but okay, wait. I mean, producer Luke, are you going to this game? I mean, I'm going to need <laughs> you to unmute your mic. Are you? I need to know. This is important information that that the people need to know. Is producer Luke going to be at Tottenham Spurs Stadium for this game? Yes, yes, I will be. Oh, okay. wow. So, see, Luke's going to be at this game. So that changes everything. Now, if Terrell Williams plays, I think he's a must-play. For no other reason <laughs> than producer Luke is there. The producer Luke narrative, he's going to see the gazelle prance in, in, in live action. This is, this is a thing now. This wow. is my home. This is where I live. It's Nothing amazing that every... The, the gazelle gift. The gazelle gift is, <laughs> is, is it's all time. 
It's it amazing that like time. all these uh, uh, England games, they get such bad quarterback play. Like they they end up with with Chase Daniel against Derek Carr. Like I feel bad for producer Luke and his countrymen. I feel like we're always sending like Blake Bortles over there and stuff. Yeah, real quick on the the Waller Tyrell Williams thing, and definitely monitoring his injury. Tyrell Williams has you know four touchdowns on twenty four targets, seventeen catches, two hundred sixteen yards. Waller, 33 catches on 37 targets for 320 yards, zero touchdowns. I expect some regression there on the positive side for him. Unfortunately, there's going to be some negative regression in terms of touchdowns for Tyrell Williams, which really is sad because hopefully you know, I want to see Tyrell keep scoring at this rate for the gifts. But that's one thing I think we can be a little bit bullish on with Waller um, is that he hasn't scored yet and he's still producing so much. Um, and, yeah, he's not going to catch – this high of a rate of his targets, but he's still going to be the number one target in this offense, in my opinion. So I really like him. And then one other guy I will throw out is Allen Robinson. Um, it's, you know, mm-hmm. Chase Daniels, not the most inspiring quarterback, but he's competent. Like you mentioned, Adam, and I want to play Allen Robinson every single week. I know he's a Penn state guy. So your thoughts on yeah. that? Yeah. Uh, I mean, uh, Allen Robinson is in the buy low model this week. I mean, he's just a guy that's been seeing opportunity and hasn't been able to capitalize yet, has had some really, really close calls, which I know P- Peter's on team watch the games and he's seen all of Allen Robinson's uh, uh, close calls. So yeah, I-, I like that. I think that's interesting. All right. Wims is the easiest play though here if, you know, uh, if Gabriel misses the game. Uh, he outsnapped Miller. So like a lot of people are gonna say, which one do we go to? In the case that Gabriel sits, it's clearly Wims at 3,500. Yeah. One other guy I'll throw out just I should I should have mentioned Cohen has done a lot better without Trubisky uh, and some of his big games have been with backup quarterbacks. So he's someone I'm watching as well. It's a, a thin play would be a tournament only type play, but uh, something to pay attention to, especially, uh, you know, if, you know, we get the injury news that we want. So he's another guy. I agree with you on whims, though, too. He's he's definitely a, a really cheap, nice value play. Uh, let's move to the Jets and Eagles, and this actually is, represents a spot that I'm really excited about. I am very bullish on this Eagles offense. They have one of the highest team totals on the slate, 44 total. They're 13 and a half point favorites, and Carson Wentz to me looks like one of the top quarterback plays on the slate. Adam, what are the news and notes here? Yeah, Deshaun Jackson is questionable. I don't know. They might sit him out in this game, especially if Luke Falk ends up uh, starting. But I think you know the Eagles have returned to relative health otherwise, which means you know they're. They're too deep at tight end and three deep at running back and and they're super deep at wide receiver also. So, you know, it's hard to pinpoint who to play Wentz with. But yeah, I agree with you that Wentz is certainly a fine play. And then, yeah, on the Sam Darnold thing, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what this dude's thinking. Like, imagine risking your spleen for the sake of the New York Jets. You know what I mean? You got to be out of your mind. So I hope he's getting uh, some advice from people outside the organization. Uh, We'll see if Sam Darnold ends up playing or not. If Sam Darnold does end up playing, I mean, it's certainly... uh, I want to play pass catchers and quarterbacks against this Eagles secondary. I mean, they're just like selling out to stop the run, which is such a donkey move, but they're selling out to stop the run. And if Darnold is back, you know, Robbie is back and Crowder is back in play and all these guys. Uh, But we'll see. I kind of doubt that Sam Darnold is going to play considering he can like actually die. So, um, yeah. There's no way he plays. Yeah. Right? Like he's allowed to lift and throw, but not cleared for contact. If you're not cleared for practice contact, how are you going to be cleared for NFL speed game contact on Sunday? That's yeah. impossible. Yeah. Right? I, I like, would be shocked if he played also. Right. I mean, obviously, Robbie Anderson, a great spot. You guys know how much I love Crowder in this offense with Sam Darnold, a quarterback. I don't think he plays personally. If I'm wrong, don't at me because whatever, the guy's risking his life. Yeah, you were wrong. He's playing. I don't care. Uh, you know, I, I'd rather him be healthy and and have this team do what we want them to do the rest of the season. So hopefully Darnold actually gets healthy before he rolls himself out there onto the field. I'd rather him, you know, walk onto the field and walk off than roll him out there and then roll him off on a cart. Yeah, I, I hope that he doesn't play too. And there's going to be some really nice buying opportunities on this Jets offense going forward. Herndon will be coming off suspension after this week. I think Darnold's obviously a huge upgrade at the quarterback position. Love Jamison Crowder. Robbie Anderson should have some big games. And if all that actually comes to fruition, Le'Veon Bell should be able to finally have some room to run and be involved in the passing game instead of just teams selling out to stop him. So for you know the future of the Jets team and for fantasy purposes going forward, I hope uh, Donald does not play. Uh, on the Eagles side, I think it's pretty simple. You, you play Carson Wentz. Uh, he's the one guy that I think makes a ton of sense. 
and you know try to figure out who 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 has the best matchup. I mean, you can make an argument for a lot of these guys. Certainly, Deshaun Jackson's injury status matters a lot. Um, but yeah, I guess Ertz will probably be the highest owned just because tight end is thin this week, especially without Kelsey and Kittle on the main slate. Mm-hmm. Um, so maybe it makes more sense to go to someone like Alshon Jeffrey or uh Miles Sanders or one of the other guys. Um, do you have a preference out of those plays, Adam? Um, or like do, do you think there's a highest equity play on the Eagles offense outside of Carson Wentz? Yeah, team preseason, Mac Hollins, baby, all in. <laughs> okay. All in on Mac Hollins at Adam Levitan if he doesn't have him in his cash game lineup. All right. <laughs> Bron- Broncos at Chargers. Uh, and I want to go on a little rant. Uh, we were talking pre pod. How does the NFL only have two four o'clock games? It absolutely ruins yep. all these slates. And you go from the red zone, which is just incredible. You have all these different things going on to just a total letdown with the Broncos at Chargers and Packers at Cowboys. I mean, two games is just terrible. But hopefully they'll get it right going forward and we have more four o'clock games. Uh, to the Broncos at Chargers, Adam, obviously Melvin Gordon's back. What are the news and notes on this game? Yeah, it seems like Mike Williams has a chance to get back too, and maybe Travis Benjamin as well. They did lose Dontrell Inman to IR, so we'll see how that wideout core uh, shakes out. Um, yeah, I mean, I think Melvin Gordon will play more in this game. I'm not sure that he'll play, uh, you know, like a full time role. Like, I wouldn't surprise me at all if Eckler still out snaps and out touches uh, Melvin Gordon this game. I think in a best case scenario for Melvin Gordon is probably 50 50, but we'll see. I mean, we'll probably get some reports there considering uh, it seemed like. Uh, national reporters had their ear inside what was going on with the Chargers considering we learned that he was going to be emergency only uh, before the game uh, on Sunday and yeah one of the best cornerback wide receiver matchups on the slate I mean Chris Harris a very very good player against Keenan Allen you know dominant dominant player Um, you know it's a question people have to ask themselves between Keenan and Julio and DeAndre Hopkins it's that I mean to me the answer is Keenan unless uh, you fear Chris Harris and I kind of do fear Chris Harris uh, a little bit. So uh, yeah, I think it's close between uh, those guys at the top of the wide out uh, salary structure for sure. Worst case scenario for Austin Eckler. Okay, this is the absolute nuclear option here. If the Chargers decide that they're going to roll out Melvin Gordon the same way that they rolled him out last year and remove Austin Eckler's role from what it is now back to what it was last year, you're still talking about 10 touches per game. 6.9 carries Uh, in the 12 games that Melvin Gordon was there, weeks one through 12, and 3.1 catches per game. I don't think there's any chance of that happening whatsoever. Now, Eckler may lose some goal line carries, so you're going to lose some touchdown equity. Uh, But I still think he sees more touches this week than Melvin Gordon the third. That may not sustain itself over the rest of the season. He's still not going to see the the massive amount of carries and massive amount of stuff that he had before or the lion's share snaps at running back. Uh, but with Justin Jackson being out, I think we're looking at maybe a 60-40 split in Eckler's favor still this week, and at worst, a 50-50 split, which still means a lot of usage in the passing game, 10 carries on the ground, uh, and he's been extremely effective, but that price has come down to reflect that, right? We've had that $1,300 price drop, so uh, I think that Eckler is one of the more important plays on the slate this week to get right from a usage perspective, because a lot of people are just going to avoid him because of the uncertainty. So digging in here from the time we're recording here on Thursday until lineups lock on Sunday uh, is going to be the most one of the most important points of the week for me to decide if I want to massively overweight the field or just match it or uh, or fade entirely because I think that I personally right now on Thursday think that he is going to out snap and out touch Melvin Gordon the third and that does not seem to be the consensus in the industry right now so that ownership may be really low in a point where we can exploit it. And Keenan yeah, Allen's a, a really good play too. Yeah, we'll see how that breaks down. And Al certainly brings up a lot of good points. Uh, one of the note, Bradley Chubb out for the year on the Broncos defense. Yeah. Um, oh no, the Broncos lost their Chubb. All right, no, no, no more talk of, of that. <laughs> uh, the Broncos own four. As a Broncos fan, I want to see them lose uh, as much as possible so we can finally get a quarterback uh, for the long term. But Chargers in a good spot here. Uh, Keenan Allen, obviously the one guy everyone's looking at and wants to play. The best player on the Broncos, or the two best players are Von Miller and Chris Harris. Um, Like you mentioned, Adam, um, Chris Harris, definitely one of the best corners still in the league. So it'll be interesting to see how much coverage he has um, on Keenan Allen. He's he's covering a lot different than he has in the past this year. So 
we'll see how that breaks down. And yeah, I, I hope Mike Williams does play. I would actually take a shot on him in tournaments. Um, he's one of my favorite upside plays. Obviously, last year, a ton of touchdowns, which we knew would regress. But when he's on the field, Rivers takes a lot of deep shots. So really only the Chargers guys. Uh, happy Cortland Sutton had a really big game last week. Uh, but I don't think this is a good spot for anyone on the Broncos offense. Um, any final thoughts, boys? I think it's a good spot for one person on the Broncos offense. I no really fan. do. I honestly do. Lindsay? Okay, all right. I've said this numerous times the first four weeks. Noah Fant's running a ton of routes. I think that he's going to win somebody at GPP yeah. at some point this season. I don't know when it's going to be, so I can't really say Noah Fant. Uh, you know, like, I, I'm not... A, tournament dart throw if you want, but who knows if it if it comes through. One week this year, though, he's going to win somebody at GPP. I just have no idea when. Uh, Cortland Sutton last year got shadowed by Hayward both times. Uh, and I had the exact receiver. numbers. Because okay, I mean I'm not I'm not arguing that, and both of those games were uh, Emmanuel Sanders was active, and Hayward shattered him on 67 of 79 routes. And those games, this is from Mike Clay, uh, posted receiving lines of three for 78 and one for 25. Assuming that this Chargers coaching staff does the same thing this year that they did last year, and have Hayward chase Sutton around the field. Manny Sanders only 200 more. I know Ashley's rostering him. Are you, Pete? Man, it's, it, you know, Ashley's better than me at social media. She's clearly better than me at <laughs> fantasy, and she's going to be just trolling me about Emmanuel Sanders. So I probably should just roster Emmanuel Sanders on a couple millionaire maker teams just so I can get the positive EV of, uh, you know, not being trolled if he does really well and I can win some money. But I haven't rostered Emmanuel Sanders really that much outside of uh, smaller slates this this year. Um, Adam, what are your thoughts? I'm I'm too biased. Yeah, I mean, he looks like he's 100 percent healthy. I mean, what what can else can we say? So you know, I haven't been playing him. I probably won't play him here, but you know, I don't think we should be discounting him for his health at this point. Yeah, Especially again, assuming that. rational quarterback play. If Hayward's on Sutton and locking him down, then that could mean some extra targets funneled towards Emmanuel Sanders. Yeah. But we're assuming right. that Joe Flacco is competent. Ashley's going to listen to this part of the podcast and just love it, Al. So you're earning major, <laughs> major points with her. Uh, all right, Ash. final game on the slate. Uh, it's a good game here. We have the Packers at Cowboys, 47 total. Cowboys currently favored by three and a half points. Uh, Adam, what are the news and notes? Yeah, one of the biggest injuries on the slate to me is the status of Devontae Adams. Um, I'd be surprised if he played at this point, but he seems to want to gut it out through through this turf toe thing uh we'll see if he can't go it's interesting I, I don't know i mean they'll definitely be in two wide sets with drama allison and marquez valdez scantling uh, i like jake kumaro he's been ex i mean shown actually shown chemistry and trust with aaron Rodgers a ton in the preseason really really productive so i don't know if he'll actually be the number three though it could be Darius shepherd uh it could be alan lazard so I, I have to keep watching that uh, jamal williams is also questionable and uh, last game, they didn't have Dexter Williams up, so it had to be all Aaron Jones. I assume if Jamal Williams is out this week, they'll have Dexter Williams up. But still, you have to expand what you think uh, the touch projection was for Aaron Jones. Regardless, uh, on the other side, Tyron Smith, I think, is a really big injury for Dallas. Obviously, one of the best left tackles in the entire league. And Michael Gallup, surprisingly, sounds like he's going to be back. I mean, I don't know. I've heard mixed mm -hmm. reports on Michael Gallup. Some say that, um, you know, he's still sore and he's not ready yet other people have said he's practicing he's ready to go so we'll have to see on michael gallup i could see that being a full-blown game time call so yeah i think that you know it's four o'clock game there's going to be a lot of uh, later decisions here though i'd love to have some roster flexibility and i think you know the decisions between zeke and dalvin and dj and wh whoever else you know kamara whatever else people have um one thing that you could say about Zeke at least is playing Zeke at least is he gives you some roster flexibility if if that's something you're interested in. That that's really the only plus to rostering Zeke here. No, I mean I, I love Zeke too. I'm no I'm no Pollard. I mean I love Pollard, but not not for daily fantasy. I mean, you realize, guys. One a gee, nobody listens one to me. A. That's one one a no one nobody listens to me. One a. <laughs> uh, Nobody's still listening to the podcast. We're an hour into the recording at this point anyway, so I can say whatever I want with impunity. Uh, the Packers are allowing the third most DraftKings points to opposing running backs. That comes on 131 yards rushing allowed to the position and 9.5 targets and seven and a half catches allowed per game. 
Can I can I tell why I hate those stats, Al? Go ahead. They're not, they're not adjusted for opponent, and they're only four weeks of, of sample. Okay, and they're only four weeks of sample. Great, I understand that. That's fine. But we have the guy who led the league in volume last year, getting back to a high volume spot, 21 plus touches each of the last couple of games after yeah. no touches the first week because he had held out and wasn't completely in game shape. Now he is. They're going to feed him at home favored against his Green Bay defense that can't stop running backs. And we're arguing over why we shouldn't play Zeke. I oh, feel I, like I'm I, taking crazy pills. <laughs> I don't think anybody's saying not to play Zeke. People I are I love saying Zeke it. <laughs> Who's saying? Who said it? You said it. No, I didn't say it. <laughs> <laughs> I love Zeke. I, I I didn't say it. I think the biggest argument for or against Zeke is not uh, anything to do with. Uh, well, I mean, the matchup is certainly fine, but but I think people would argue that his pass game role is not what it what it was before. I mean, that's it. But I don't know if that's true. I mean, he's just kind of like Al said, he's kind of just getting back into shape. So. So wait, you just use sample size to tell me that his past game yeah. usage isn't what it was before. Or, sorry, you use sample size to tell me that the DVP is not useful, but you're saying on the four, same four game sample size, his past game usage isn't what it was before when he had seven targets in week four. Uh, I don't want to say that it, I, my biggest problem with those stats, and I, I, I know, uh, you know, a lot of people use them is that every not team uses running backs. Every, not it's not, tight end, I agree with you. Tight end, I'm with you. DVP yeah. tight end is very dangerous and noisy. Every team uses running backs. <laughs> but some of them are worse than others. <laughs> right, but most of them are fine because running backs don't matter. <laughs> oh, now we're really getting into it. <laughs> As a contrarian play, let me suggest Tony Pollard. <laughs> Tony Pollard! <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, I, I have a Pollard truther. I think that this Cowboys offense... They, especially like thinking logically, which I don't think they are. If you invest this much money in a running back, you should try to, you know, protect him a little bit. Like I, I think Z yeah. should be in that 20 touch kind of zone and they should give Pollard some work in the passing game. I think he's clearly a better pass catching back and more of like the Kamara type than Zeke. Um, the receivers, I'm definitely monitoring the Gallup news. And I actually think if Gallup plays, that helps the entire offense. We saw last week, pretty easy for the Saints to game plan. Stop Zeke and make sure Amari Cooper doesn't get open. Um, you know, put two guys on him. So I hope Gallup plays. I think that makes the offense that much more efficient. And hopefully, um, you know, Moore is the guy calling the plays. I mean, obviously it was last week, but they went in with such a conservative game plan. Uh, this Dallas offense obviously had really weak opponents to start, but would like to see them be more aggressive. Uh, Dak Prescott coming off a bad game. Everyone was in love with him for the first three weeks of the season. Is he a quarterback that we can get really low owned uh, and pair him with, you know, Amari Cooper, who obviously I like, or Al, what about Jason Witten? <laughs> <laughs> Jason Witten has looked like a man who found Ponce. He's, he's the Ponce de Leon of, of tight ends. Comes out of the booth, gets four targets every single game this season. I'm not rostering him at all. But in this hand, Pete, for those of you guys watching the video on YouTube or if this is on Twitter and social media right now, these are three pens. These three pens represent one more pen than Tony Pollard had snaps in week four. And we're worried about Tony Pollard in week five. I, I can't. I'm not. I'm joking about Tony <laughs> Pollard. I just, I want to see him play and... Yeah, Jason Witten has two touchdowns, 14 catches on 16 targets. I mean, Mr. Reliable. Real. Yeah, He's also uh, built three swing sets this season. All right, let, let, some real analysis. Let's say Devontae Adams misses. Where do we rank? How how far up does that That's move? MVS, Allison, and the other pass catchers. I, I like Kumarov quite a bit. Um, how, how much does that move him up? And like you said, Adam, it gives you flexibility, but it's also really tough to figure out how much salary to leave um because yeah. you only have two games here at the end so right um yeah that's tricky. the problem like the flexibility is great but there's not that many options to choose from because there's only two games so yeah it's not great yeah. uh yeah i you think, think DraftKings did adjust uh, DraftKings adjusted prices though on, they knew that because the game was on thursday they were like prepared mm -hmm. so you're not getting a bargain i mean mvs is 5600 and allison is 5k like i don't think they're that you know Kumaro's like 38 yeah, yeah, they didn't move Kumaro, but yeah, I mean, MVS is like the same as Allen Robinson and like only 900 less than Tyler Boyd. Like, um, I wish, well, not I wish, but if they had been cheaper, I'd be, I'd be more excited about it. Jimmy Graham coming off of a nine target game without Alice or without uh, the possibility of without Adams. Are you interested in him at 4,300 or is he just the corpse of Jimmy Graham? He does kind of look like a zombie in his DK picture. Yeah, no, I mean, 
he uh, clearly is the go-to guy in the red zone. Like when they get to the end zone, like Aaron Rodgers wants to throw to Jimmy Graham. So I, I've heard mm-hmm. worse ideas. All right. Yeah, tight ends week and Jimmy Graham. I think that first week looked awesome and hasn't looked quite as spry since, uh, which I think is just the nature of getting into the season and getting more beat up. But yeah, he's getting a lot of red zone looks. I think he's interesting as well. Um, all right, that's the slate. Al, get us out of here. Guys, go check out the Listener League. Easiest way to find it, go to Google, type DFS Edge Playbook. That'll take you to the Listener League landing page. Scroll down just a little bit, and you'll find the link to join the Listener League. You guys should know how to do it by now. Uh, other than that, appreciate you guys tuning in once again. If you wouldn't mind dropping a a, uh, a comment on this podcast, give us a review. Five stars would be appreciated. Four is just fine. If you think we're average, three star. But do something. Click something, please. We would greatly appreciate it. Uh, for Adam, for Jerry, for Luke going to Tottenham Stadium this week, and for Peter, I'm Al. Catch you guys later. Bye, everybody. We are promoters at DraftKings and also avid fans. Our usernames are Adam Levitan, Al Smizzle, and CSURAM88. We may sometimes play on our personal accounts in the games that we offer advice on. Although we have expressed our personal view on the games and strategies in this podcast, they do not necessarily reflect the views of DraftKings, and we also may deploy different players and strategies than what we recommended in this podcast.